So how is everybody doing? Are you ready for uh, for this challenge and to get things uh, started? Good, good. Eric, we've got, oh, we've got people. What's so nice about this group is we've got literally people from all over the world and it is such a special thing to have and to uh, to be a part of. So first, thank you guys so much for uh, being a part of this and for showing up uh, to this uh, to this challenge. And again, I'm honored to have you here. And one of my hopes is really that you get at least one gold nugget that will help you on your journey, something that will help you move forward. Uh, one of the goals for this challenge, at least for here, is, is to provide 5,000 meals to Feeding America. Last year, we did a little over 5,000 meals for Feeding America, so I think we'll probably uh, we'll probably hit it again this year. We've got, uh, I want to say, a little over, I don't know, 1,500, 1,600 people that are registered for the event, so hopefully people will get on. Uh, but since it is worldwide, uh, you know, we do have people from all over. Uh, a lot of people do the replay as well, so we will be sending out a replay uh, for everybody. So if you miss something, obviously you'll be able to get in on the replay. And this will be somewhat of an interactive-ish type of uh, challenge. Uh, I'll ask a few things just to put in, the, you know, put in the chat here and there just so I can monitor and see how things are going and to, you know, kind of uh, uh, ask you a few questions here and there, but it won't be, won't be too much. And save any questions that you have. At the end, we're going to be doing a Q&A. All righty. So, Buckle up because it's going to be a pretty busy, uh, pretty busy day. Uh, we've got an hour and a half, and uh, I'll stay longer if needed, especially for uh, Q and A if it goes longer. Uh, but we've got very busy. We're going to go through every one of the steps of Think and Grow Rich. So there's a lot, a lot, a lot to cover. Now the goal of the Think and Grow Rich Challenge is really to look at the book itself, uh, to go through some of the misconceptions of Think and Grow Rich, because there are a lot of misconceptions about the book. Uh, understand the philosophies in Think and Grow Rich and how we can really utilize that uh, for a blueprint for moving forward. And basically what I've done is I've distilled all of the steps in Think and Grow Rich into actionable tools. And we're going to go over all the steps. All the tools are in the workbook that uh, that was sent out. Uh, I'll put it in the chat a little bit later as well. So uh, you'll have the workbook. All of the steps are in there. All the tools are in there. Uh, so you can always go back to that as well. We're going to do a deep dive this year into, we always do a deep dive or a deeper dive into two of the, uh, two of the steps. Uh, this year, we're going to do a deeper dive into step one, desire. And then the ninth step, which is the mastermind principle. And I want to do those mainly because there are two steps that you can really start to take and use right now while you're developing the other stuff within the book, right? You can start those immediately. Everything starts with a desire. You'll see that. So that's one of the reasons why I want to do that one. Uh, and today, this isn't really a book study. So we're not going to really dive deep into the book itself a whole bunch, uh, so it's really not a book study. It's really, again, learning some of the philosophies within it and some of the things that we're going to do. So we're going to go ahead and get started. All right. So here we go. Okay. Just a brief, brief story about myself. Uh, the philosophies and Think and Grow Rich uh, really took me from on my own and homeless at 15 to turning my life around and creating my first multi-million dollar tech company uh, and leading... Uh, you know, pretty powerful teams for some of the biggest nation from some of the nation's uh, most prestigious companies by 30. And I don't say that to try to impress. I don't say that to uh, just spout that out. I would up to literally up to maybe six, seven years ago, nobody knew my, my story. I was so ashamed of my past that no one ever, ever knew my story. So I don't say that to impress. And the thing that thing about it is, is even after I did that, even after I sold my first company for, for millions of dollars, I still felt like an imposter. I had done all this work, even though I had on paper, I, I had all of this success, right? But I still felt like an imposter. Uh, now type one in the chat if you've ever felt like an imposter after you reached a goal or after you reached some level of success and you got there and it's like, eh, I don't deserve this. This was just luck. Uh, this wasn't, you know, th this wasn't meant to be, this is just luck and, and I feel like an imposter. Yeah. And, and most of us, that's by default. And, and the reason is, is it wasn't until I actually read Think and Grow Rich. So I didn't read, even though the philosophies of Think and Grow Rich took me 
from where I was to where I went, it wasn't because of the book, it was the philosophies. But it wasn't until I read Think and Grow Rich that I understood, hold on, I just wasted 10 years thinking I was an imposter, wasted 10 years you know, thinking that I was just lucky. Until we understand that everything we get, we've created. Both good and bad, everything that we have got, we've created. It's not luck that you've got the success, the success that you had. It's not luck that I did what I did. Uh, in fact, what I did was I used the laws of success and I didn't even realize that I had done it. And because I didn't know how I did it, that's why I felt like an imposter. When we don't know that we create everything we have, we feel like an imposter that when we get something. And this is really why I'm so passionate about the philosophies in Think and Grow Rich. And actually all of that started my fascination with neuroscience and led me to become like an NLP coach. And I, what I absolutely love doing is intertwining cutting edge scientific insights with the timeless uh, wisdom of these philosophies with stuff like Think and Grow Rich, because they do go hand in hand, believe it or not. You know, 15 years ago, people thought it was all woo woo stuff. And now they're like, whoa, there's some science behind all this. So that's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about this book. That's why I try to uh, enlighten people about this book. This is why I do these challenges. These are why I do these things because there's such power in that book and it changed my life. And just knowing that that it's a process and not luck, uh, really, is, again, it's why I do why I do what I do. So before we get so put in the how many uh, put a one in the chat if you've at least read Think and Grow Rich one time. And again, this it doesn't matter if you've ever read the book for this challenge at all. Uh, but if you've at least read it once, put a two if you've uh, if you've never or if you've, if you have it or you picked it up, you've never you've never really read the book. Put put a two in the chat if you. And again, no, absolutely. There's a, I talk to a lot of people that have never actually read Think and Grow Rich. Okay, so we have a mix of both. So that's good. So I'm going to, and, and the reason why I asked that, I want to kind of uh, tailor some of the stuff that we do to where a lot of the people are. Okay. So some of the biggest misconceptions about Think and Grow Rich, uh, by the way, the title is absolutely fantastic. Uh, probably some of the best marketing that I've actually seen, but the biggest misconception is the book is not about money. Whoa. People like what? The book is not about money. It's about success and success really in any aspect of your life. It's not just about money. It's whatever success means to you. And the second biggest misconception is that you can just think and grow rich, or you can just think and grow successful. And that is just not the case. You can't just think and grow successful. You have to actually do and take actions and, and actually do the stuff that's in the book. So the book should, to me, the book really should have been called Think and Grow Successful, not Think and Grow Rich. But again, it's the marketing from a marketing standpoint. It is absolutely fantastic. It's people still pick up the book because of the title. Uh, but here's a little backstory that some people might know, some people might not know is in 1925, Hill completed the original Laws of Success. And uh, this was the book that he did prior to Think and Grow Rich. And on the left-hand side up there is a galley copy of the original Laws of, Law of Success. Now, the only known copy was purchased last year by Russell Brunson for $1.5 million. He paid for that and oh boy. Uh, and this, so that book right there, that is what Hill took 25 years to write. You know, people think he took 25 years to write Think and Grow Rich. It was really the law of success that he all of that was really for was the law of success. You know, interviewing 25,000 people and, you know, 500 of the most successful people of, of all time, at the, you know, again, at that time. And that 1925 version was never published. That copy you see there was never published. That is a galley copy. What Hill did is he sent it out to a few galley copies to people in the industry. Uh, I heard one of them was a president. Uh, one of them was uh, very high up people in industry, in in politics. And one of the copies went to Henry Ford. And it is said that Henry, Henry Ford refused to let him publish that because of the stuff that was in there, the, the law of success that was in there, uh, the things that he talked about, he would not allow it to be, uh, to be published. And then in 1928, a new 
reduced version of the Law of Success was published, and that's the one on the right. That's the one that you can go to the bookstore and you can buy. Uh, you can get a copy of Law of Success. Again, there's many different copies. But then we had the Great Depression in 1929 to 1939. And money was the number one pain point for people within the, within the country by far the number one thing. That's what people were most scared about. That was their fear that they lost everything. So that's why in 1937, the laws of success, laws of success was again reduced to a more digestible, uh, more direct version called Think and Grow Rich. So it's really just a version, think of it almost as a niche version of law of success. In other words, he could have niched down and said, uh, Think and Grow to be a CEO. Think and grow to be an Olympic athlete. You know, think and grow to be a, a Michelin star chef. Whatever it is, it's just a niche down version of the law of success. So that's really what it is. It's really just a combination of the law of success and some tactical steps for readers to use to rise again. So that's really kind of the backstory of Think and Grow Rich and how it how it came about. Uh, but it is a very very impactful book. Right here is a copy of the first edition, a uh, first edition, first print book, and I actually have it right here. So this is, a matter of fact, this is a copy that Russell Brunson sent to me. Uh, he has been in the mode of collecting books uh, pretty, uh, pretty regularly, but uh, that's an original version of uh, first print of the of, uh, Think and Grow Rich. And I put that in there because I want you to take a look. It's, this isn't in the, the download that you have. I'm not sure how many versions this is in, but this is the very beginning of the book. And you can see what it says. It says, what do you want most? Is it money, fame, power, contentment, personality, peace of mind, happiness? He doesn't say just money, right? It's not, again, this is Think and Grow Rich, but you can see this is actually coming from a place that's not just Think and Grow Rich. And he says the 13 steps uh, the 13 Steps to Riches described in this book offer the shortest dependable philosophy of individual achievement ever presented for the benefit of the man or woman who is searching for a definite goal in life. He doesn't say to get rich quick. He doesn't say, you know, this is about money. This is the shortest dependable philosophy of individual achievement. And that's really what Think and Grow Rich is. And this is why the book has stood the test of time. This is why so many people that you uh, hear talk about this book. Almost every one of my mentors, people that I follow from God, Tony Robbins, uh, John Mack, everybody I ever really follow has mentioned Think and Grow Rich as part of their uh, you know, learning for, for how they, before beginning the book, you will profit greatly if you recognize the fact that the book is not written to entertain. You cannot digest the contents properly in a week or a month. This takes time for to read, and that's why I normally do only two steps per uh, per year for these challenges. But the beautiful thing about Think and Grow Rich is it meets you where you're at. I read the book once every year, at least once every year, and it always changes. Every time I read this damn book, there's something new. I swear they put something new in that thing every single time. Every time I read, I'm like, that was not there last year. It was not that there last year. But it grows with you. And again, that's another reason why it stood the test of time is no matter when you read it, no matter where you are in your journey, there are things within there for you to move forward, right? There's things for you to grow with the book. And again, to me, that's why it is such a powerful book. All right. So here are the 13 steps in Thinking Grow Rich. Some of these steps you need to embody. Some of these steps you need to become these steps. These need to be a part of you. And some of them are tactical. And the tactical ones are things from, again, back in that time, they were going through the depression. It's like there's things in the book about, you know, doing your resume, about doing, there's things that very tactical and uh, things for the time and for that niche thing that they were going through for Thinking Grow Rich that, yeah, they don't necessarily, the philosophy is great, but some of the very tactical steps don't necessarily uh, guide us today where we need to go. So we'll, and I'll, I'll point those out, but here's the 13 steps. Uh, the first chapter is actually now uh, in, in the book that you downloaded and, and in this original edition is called The Introduction. It's the introduction chapter. Now, if you pick up a new book of Think and Grow Rich, one of the newer ones, it's either like The Power of Thought or Thoughts Become Things because it is such a powerful chapter. It is not an introduction. It is an introduction to the philosophy. It's not a book introduction. And that's where I, I'm glad they actually changed that because 
who reads the introduction? But I, I don't know about you, but whenever I pick up a book and it says introduction, I don't read the introduction. That's yeah. The, I, I normally go to the last chapter and, and read and find out the find out the ending. So, anyways, step one uh, is desire, the starting point of all achievement. That's the first one that we're going to dive in deep to tonight. Uh, step two is faith, visualization of and belief in attainment of desire. This is the this is the faith in you. Right. This is the faith that you can do what you're setting out to do. That's what that faith is. Number three, auto uh, step three is auto suggestion, the medium for influencing the subconscious mind. That is such a powerful, powerful step. Uh, step four, specialized knowledge, personalized experience and observation. Uh, very much needed from a philosophy standpoint, but some of that again is a very tactical thing that was you know for the time. Step five, imagination, the workshop of the mind. Another one of my probably one of my favorite uh, steps and favorite chapters in the book. Uh, step number six, organized planning, uh, the crystallization of desire into action. That is, a, again, all, you, all of these steps have to be in here. That's, that's the thing. Some of them I feel are more important, some not as important, but they all have to be there and they all have to be done uh, to a certain extent. Uh, step seven is decision, the mastery of procrastination. Step eight is persistence. The, st the sustained effort necessary to induce faith. One of the things you'll notice that all of these steps, they intertwine with each other, right? They go hand in hand, they build on each other, they do things, they're, they're together. So, you know, again, persistence, the sustained effort necessary to induce faith. That's one of the ones we use to induce the faith step. Uh, number nine, the uh, power of the mastermind, the driving force that is truly the driving force of almost every successful person that you've ever met. Again, that's one of the ones that we are going to dive deeper in tonight. Uh, step number 10, the mystery of sex transmutation. What? It's not what you think. People see that. A lot of people who actually train thinker to rich don't even touch this chapter because of the name, you know, uh, the mystery of sex transmutation, but that's really not what it's about. We'll go through that really quickly. It's one of the ones, uh, step 11, the subconscious mind, the connecting link, boy, is he right on that. Step 12, the brain, the broadcasting and receiving station for thought. I'm going to say this. He was well ahead of his time when he looked at the brain as a broadcast and receiving station for thought. And we'll actually, I'll touch base on that a little bit when we get there. Uh, step 13, the sixth, uh, the sixth sense, uh, the door to the temple of wisdom. That's when hunches come in. That's when you get these ideas that when you're able to pull things out of, uh, you know, out of infinite intelligence. So those are the 13 steps within Think and Grow Rich. And my goal for this year's challenge is to, again, dive into two of the most important steps that you can start immediately while giving the other steps time to grow. Again, you cannot digest this book in a month. You cannot digest it in six months. It takes time. So this is from page 30. And again, so whenever I, whenever I do anything, pull anything from the book on my challenges or my workshops, I'm going to give you the line numbers and normally the page number. So you can write those down so you can easily go back to it. So this is page 30, line 168 through 172. Now, this was written probably 90 to 100 years ago, and it's just as true today. Uh, and th again, throughout this challenge, I'm going to give you the line numbers. And here's what he says. We who are in this race for riches or success, whatever you want to call it. Again, it's not about money. Race for riches should be encouraged to know that this changed world in which we live in is demanding new ideas new ways of doing things, new leaders, new investments, new methods of teaching, new methods of marketing, new books, new literature, new features for radio, new ideas for moving pictures. You just take and change some of those technologies from you know radio and moving pictures to, I don't know, internet and the other technologies that we have right now. Back of all the demand for this new and better things, there is one quality which one must possess to win. And that is definiteness of purpose, the knowledge of what one wants and a burning desire to possess it. Right there on line 70, 173 so through 175, that's part of the, the, that's part of the secret. You know, how many people have heard about the, you know, the movie, The Secret, right? That's based kind of on Think and Grow Rich. There's a secret in the book and he says it here. There's a secret that's in every chapter. That's part of the secret. We're going to go over the secret in a second and actually give you the secret it's not really a secret, but it's there and it's in every chapter and everything you see, it's, it's actually part of it. So we'll actually go over the secret, but that's part of the secret right there. And look at that for a second, because that is just as pliable today as it was a hundred years ago. 
know, if we're in this for success, we should be encouraged to know that this changed world in which we're living in is demanding these things. It's still demanding the same exact things today as it did 90 to 100 years ago. If you wanted to successfully get to the other side of this thinly frozen lake, let's say this is a very thinly frozen lake, how would you cross it? Fire up in the chat, how would you cross that thin ice lake if you had to get to the other side? Go ahead and put it put in the chat, what would you do? Now, I'm gonna tell you this, there's no shortcuts. You can't go around. You can't take a magic pill to the other side. You can't do, you know, there's no shortcuts. If you had to walk across that, how would you walk across that ice, that thin ice? How would you do that? One step at a time, very carefully. <laughs> horizontally, <laughs> lie down and move, slow and steady. Here's what I would do, and it's based on what I've learned from Think and Grow Rich. Number one, I would find someone who had already successfully crossed. That's number one, right? Number two, I would find their footsteps in the ice that led them to success. And step three, I would take the exact same steps they took. I wouldn't deviate a bit. I wouldn't move just a little to the right, a little to the left. I would take those exact same steps. Well, that's exactly what Think and Grow Rich is. It's the successful steps that people took to reach the success. That's exactly what it is. You're looking at their footsteps of what they said. Here is what I did. Here is my feet print in the snow or the ice that took me to that. Right? So that's, that's all this is. And all again, all my mentors, every successful person that I know, whether it's an athlete or uh, someone that's a you know, business, it doesn't matter. They've all, they, you can see these steps in everything that they do. All right. So we're going to begin. And here's how, again, here's how we're going to progress. We're going to do uh, desire first. Or well, we're going to do the introduction first, then we're going to do desire, then we're going to do the power of the mastermind. Those are a little bit diaper, uh, deeper dives. And then what we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're just going to do all the steps and go over the tools. However much time we have, we'll do that and we'll make sure that we spend enough time, uh, have enough time for Q&A. And again, that way we get the, the two primary ones done and out of the way so we know that we have time for those. And then we will uh, hit everything else as, as we go. And here we go. So let's start with chapter one, the introduction. Again, now, if you, if you look at a newer book, it's the, you know, the power of thought or thoughts become things. This is really a foundation for the book. And if you grasp this, you're going to, it's going to make going through the book a little bit more easy, make it a little bit more digestible because it'll make more sense to you. And it's here that he'll introduces the concept that thoughts combined with purpose persistence and desire can manifest into material success. And that is the secret. That, that is the secret you, right there that he introduces right here, combined uh, the concept of thoughts combined with purpose, persistence, and desire can manifest into material success. And he presents the idea that one's thoughts and beliefs shape their reality. And that by learning to think positively, and focusing on your goals, individuals can achieve success and wealth, or whatever that means to them. And one of the key ideas of Think and Grow Rich is the concept of the law of attraction, right? That's, we, we're hearing all this, this, the law of attraction, Think and Grow Rich, it's what you're attracting to yourself, which suggests that individuals can attract success and abundance into their lives by focusing their thoughts and energy on what they desire. That's what it is. You focus on what you want, what you desire, and that's what you're gonna get. Now let's see what some other thought leaders say about power of thought. Here's one, your words become your actions, your actions become your habits, and your habits become your destiny, Mahatma Gandhi. So it's not just thoughts become things, right? It's thoughts become your actions, which then become the things. You are today where your thoughts have brought you. You will be tomorrow where your thoughts take you, James Allen. I could literally go on and on and on about this. Uh, th th there's quotes like this everywhere. You can go on and on. So we're going to go to page 10, lines 11 through 13. This is the very first, very first paragraph of the introduction. Very first paragraph of an introduction. And it starts off, truly thoughts are things and powerful things at that. And what most people do is they stop there. They just think, okay, thoughts are things and they're powerful things. I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to think about my beach house that I want. It's not coming. It's, it's, not, it's not getting here. You can't just think and do that. that. And that's not what he says. He says, truly thoughts are things and powerful things when 
They are mixed with definiteness of purpose, persistence, and a burning desire for their translation into riches or other material objects. Again, whatever your success is. The definiteness of purpose, a single purpose. We need to stop being squirrels and pick one. Stick with it until. We have an idea, let's stick with it until. Until it's done, until it's successful. We need to go an inch wide and a mile deep. You know that if you have an idea, you are automatically resourced to get it. You might need to be resourceful. You might need to think outside the box, but you're automatically resourced to get it. But to get it, you will need persistence. You know, you must be determined to stand by that desire until it's realized. You need a burning desire, not a wish, but a burning freaking desire. Right here is where he'll, he'll introduce the concepts that thoughts combined with purpose, persistence, and desire can manifest into their material success. Right there is the secret in the first damn paragraph of the introduction. That is the secret right there. So you're going to see that throughout this book, but that is the secret. And he gives some examples in here, uh, three feet from gold and 50 cent lessons in, in persistence. We won't go into those, but one thing I can say, so I want you to keep in mind if you're reading this original version of the book that it was written a hundred years ago, right? The way, th the way they talked back then is different than how we talk now. Things that were acceptable back then are no longer acceptable, nor should they be. And I can tell you this, if we write something today in a hundred years, the people reading it will say, that's not acceptable. It's because we change, we evolve, right? So if you're reading this book, I don't agree with some of the ways he says things in here. I really don't. But the philosophies are solid. The philosophies are there. So, And I always like to get the original over the... You can get new versions of Thinking Grow Rich that don't have any of that stuff in there that are very washed down. But I, I want the original because I think that's really where the energy and the power comes from. But again, it was written 100 years ago. And there's things that I do not like. And if you read the original, there's probably going to be a few things that don't resonate with you on how they, on how they talk or how he talks. And if there is anything I really want you to take away from this chapter, it's this. The thoughts that we have today will determine the future we have tomorrow. 100%. The thoughts we have today will determine the, the future that we have tomorrow. Our thoughts alter. They literally alter how we see, hear, and most importantly, how we experience the world. They absolutely change. Just our thoughts change how we see, hear, and experience the world. And everything begins with your thoughts. They are the starting point of all that will be tangible in your life, just as the things in your life today are a reflection of what you've previously thought. And if you think thoughts of success, you will experience a life to achieve that success. And what does this mean? Well, this means that you can create your own destiny, your own luck, right? Every day you get to choose what you think and therefore how your life is going to unfold. This is a you and you deal. With me, it's a me and me deal. The thoughts I have, they're my choice. I can choose whatever thoughts I want. I can choose positive or negative, and that's how my life's going to unfold. But it's my choice, right? It's a me and me deal. So it's a you and you deal on, on the stuff that you, on how you think and what you think on a daily basis, on a hourly basis, on a minute basis. And another part of the secret is the burning desire. And here he is talking about Barnes going into uh, going to Mr. Edison to go into partnership with him. Uh, it's pay it's line twenty two through twenty seven. I think about this though. That, that's like me going into Elon Musk's office or Richard Branson's office and say, you know what, Elon, I'm here to go into business with you. Right? That takes some <laughs> cojones, all right? I mean, you, you just don't do that. But he goes. So here he says, when the desire or impulse first uh, impulse of thought first flashed into his mind, he was in no position to act upon it. Two difficult stood in his way. One, he didn't even know Mr. Edison. And two, he didn't even have enough money to pay his railroad fare to New Jersey, to Orange, New Jersey. He didn't even know the guy. He didn't have money to get there. When you start working the book, you're going to have new ideas. You're going to see these things. You're going to have these thoughts that don't match your reality. Right? You're going to have thoughts that don't match what currently is in your physical space. They're just not going to match. And what do we normally do when we have these? Right? What do we, when we have a thought that's outside of our physical realm, outside of our current space, we say, I don't know who that is. You know, 
I don't know the people. I don't have the money. I don't have the time. You know, I don't have the resources. I don't know how to do it. And that's how we normally think. And that's how we normally see these things that are outside of our, our normal awareness. And through the book, we start to learn and recognize them and become resourceful. So part of the book is starting to recognize those thoughts that you get, that they're not just wild goose things. You know, yeah, that'll never work, Sean. Come on. Right? I, I get an idea. Hey, call so-and-so. No, that's not going to work. They, they don't want this crap. Right? We do this stuff all the damn time. That's, how, that's our default mode when we have these ideas that are outside our current realm. And uh, 297 through 299. Success comes to those who become success conscious. Failure comes to those who indifferently allow themselves to become failure conscious. And for this, I, I, write this down. I want you to think of it this way. I want you to think of success conscious, because that's a weird thing. When I say success conscious, people normally don't understand what I say, or they don't fully understand it. Simply, I want you to think of it simply as the habit of successful thoughts. So if you have the habit of successful thoughts, that's a success conscious, right? And if you have a failure conscious, it's really just the habit of negative or, or failure thoughts, right? That's all it is. It's having those, those habits of positive thoughts. That is what success conscious is. So in every, again, in every uh, chapter and every step we're gonna have tools, uh, the goal of the introduction challenge today is to learn what your thought patterns are. Again, success conscious and failure conscious, you know, we need to know what our thought patterns are and become aware of our thoughts. Uh, people who achieve su uh, success do so because they have a success conscious. They spend their time thinking about success rather than doubting themselves or thinking about how things can go wrong. How many times or do we sit around and say, you know, this is not going to work. How is this going to go wrong? And we, we literally envision things going wrong, right? We're, we're, we're tracking that into our lives. And after the challenge, I want you to sit down and answer these two questions, the box on the right. What do you spend most of the time thinking about? And are these thoughts getting you closer to or further from your dreams? Be honest with yourself. Just sit down over the next week and, and, and kind of put this in and, and start taking, again, this is an awareness exercise to see where we're at. And then for the next five days, I challenge you to put, uh, put a place a tick mark every time you have a negative thought or a limiting belief. Tick, tick mark. It doesn't have to be on this, it could be on something else, but put a tick mark on something every time you have a negative thought. If you're anything like me, you're gonna need a box way bigger than that, because I did the same thing. We, on a regular basis, I guarantee everybody on here, uh, me included, by the time I get up and walk through my bathroom in the morning, I've had at least one or two negative thoughts, right? Look, look at myself in the mirror, oh shit, I gotta go on a diet, uh, whatever it is. Literally, by the time my feet hit the floor, I've, I've had one or two. And it's like, so we've, we've got to become aware of when we're doing this, right? And by marking a tick mark, basically what you're doing is you're teaching yourself to become aware of those thoughts. Not get rid of them yet. You're just becoming aware of those thoughts. All right, so let's get on to step one. And this is where really where today's begins. And it's on desire, the starting point of all achievement. Uh, this is the first step. And it is really an important step and one that really should spend a lot, a lot of time on. Uh, there's, uh, I do workshops where we'll, we'll literally spend, you know, several days on just the desire because it's, it's that big. So let's first look at what other thought leaders might say about desire. You know, Mark Twain, I can teach anyone how to get anything they want out of life. The problem is I can't find anybody who can tell me what they want. That's their desire, right? They, nobody knows what they desire. Uh, James Allen, a burning desire is the starting point of all accomplishments. Just like a small fire cannot give much heat, a weak desire cannot produce great results. You've got to have the burning desire. Zig Ziglar, your desire must be defined, strong, burning if you are to achieve your goals. You've, you've got, and that's part of what we're doing. So all this leads to thinking you're rich. This, all this leads to this step, right? This is what this step is about. It's about developing that, uh, that burning desire. Uh, Earl Nightingale, desire is the most powerful thing in the world. It creates everything. It is the starting point of all achievement. All right, so we're going to get going here. I want you to take a look at this piece of paper. This piece of paper is literally from one of Tony Robbins' journals from 1978. Everything on there 
is from Think and Grow Rich. Every, every quote on there, obviously he was going through Think and Grow Rich when he, when he did this. So these are all from Think and Grow Rich. And in big letters at the bottom, he writes, desire is the key. Every single person on this planet has the ability, and I personally think the responsibility to tap into their power to create a life that they actually desire, a life of meaning for them, whatever that is, whatever that meaning is. And it all starts with a simple but very critical question. What is it that you want? What are you really after and why? And I'm going to ask you, do you have a clear picture of what it is that you really desire the most uh, in your relationships, in your health, in your business, in your life? You know, do you have a clear picture of that? And I ask you uh, right now, do you know what you want? You know, if I ask you right now, do you know what you want? Most people that I talk to, it's hard for them to answer that. If I ask you right now, do you know what you want? Most people will say, well... If they do have an answer, it's very vague. It's like, I want to be happy, or I want more money, or I want to lose weight, or whatever it is. But the funny thing is, is if I ask them what they don't want, they can get specific. Their hand comes up. Well, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. Very specific on what they don't want. But yet they don't know what they truly desire. And if thoughts become things and we know exactly details of what we don't want, and we don't know the details of what we do want and what we do desire, what do you think we're gonna get in life? We're going to attract the things that we don't want. That's why getting down to this level of desire is such an important thing, regardless of whether you do think and grow rich or anything else, knowing what you want is so important. And I'm telling you, your life will radically transform when you're able to answer this question with, you know, with clarity, uh, conviction and commitment to the highest standards. Clarity is power. Clarity is power. Clarify what you want at the level of your soul. And that is what this chapter is really about. And really the rest of the book, it's about getting to that desire. So we'll, we'll actually go through that, but Again, all these steps are intertwined and a lot of the steps actually tie into building that desire, right? They go in and that's actually how you build the desire. And the more clear you are about what you want, uh, what you desire, the easier it is to make your vision a reality. And I'm telling you, once you know this, you will have an unstoppable burning desire that will catapult you to success. And it all starts with desire, right? And it's a word from Latin roots that means of the sire, or of the father, to birth an idea. In other words, that strong impulse to achieve something is actually the something already in you seeking to come out. I mean, this is a reminder that our biggest goals and our deepest dreams, they really just answer a question uh, that's really serving something much bigger than ourselves. That's what these are. They're all in us. It's already there. They're already trying to come out. We just need to see them and to let them out and to recognize them. And he starts off this uh, chapter, uh, this is our chapter lines 13 through 22. When Edward C. Barnes climbed down from the, the freight train in Orange, New Jersey, more than 30 years ago, he may have resembled that of a tramp, but his thoughts were those of a king, right? As he made his way from the railroad track to Thomas Edison's office, his mind was at work. He saw himself standing in Mr. Edison's presence. He heard himself asking Mr. Edison for an opportunity to carry out his one consuming obsession of his life, a burning desire to become the business associate of the great inventor. He saw it. He heard it. He felt it. He was living it before he even got there. Barnes' desire was not a hope. It was not a wish. It was a keen, pulsating desire which transcends everything else. It was definite, right? He had a definite desire. And going on to 23 through 30, the desire was not new when he approached Edison. It had been Barnes' dominating desire for a long time. In the beginning, when the desire first appeared in his mind, it may have been and probably was only a wish. I want you to look at that. I want you to kind of read that for a second. When he first had that idea, it, was, it wasn't it was a burning desire. It was just a wish, a flash in the mind. Poof, 
We get those all the time, right? We get these little flashes. We get these little hunches. We get these little ideas. But it was no mere wish when he appeared before Edison. And one of the most frequent questions I get is, what if I don't have a burning desire? I get that question all the time. Well, you know, when people come into my coaching, when they do things, like, I don't have a burning desire. Here's the thing. You will never just have a burning desire. It doesn't just magically appear. It doesn't just, you know, spontaneously combust into a burning desire in you. Burning desires always start as just that flash of an idea, that wish for something that you want, that whatever that is that you, that you're, you, know, you think and you're just like a hunch. It's like, I, I, I want to do that. That's the way they start. We have to build it into a burning desire. And that's where the steps in Think and Grow Rich come in. They help us build that wish, that idea, that hunch into that burning desire. And a few years later, uh, Edward, uh, Edwin C. Barnes again stood before Edison in the same office where he first met the inventor. This time, his desire had been translated into reality. He was in business with Edison. The dominating dream of his life had become a reality. It is a remarkable, uh, line 45, it is a remarkable illustration of the power of a definite desire. Barnes won his goal because he wanted to be a business associate with Mr. Edison more than anything else that he wanted, more than anything else. He created a plan by which to attain that purpose, but he burned all bridges behind him. That's critical there. He burned all bridges behind him. He stood by his desire until it became the dominating obsession of his life and finally a fact. So it didn't just pop in and was this all-consuming desire when he had it right? He stood by that desire until it became the dominating obsession of his life. He kept going. He kept going. He kept going. He kept, you know, being obsessed with that idea and doing it. And you're building and you're building and you're building. That's how you get to that point. It never just happens. And this uh, right here is what the philosophy of, of this chapter is really about. You know, you can have anything that you desire. You really, anything that you can come up with, anything that you can desire, you can have that in reality. But it takes that momentum. It takes that building into a burning desire. All right. So what exactly does a burning desire look like? You know, people will say all the time, you know, what does, you know, I, I, I think I desire something, but what is a burning desire? Let's talk about a story, uh, the story of burning your boats. I'm sure everyone's heard the story, you know, burn your boats. People talk about it all the time, burn your boats, burn your boats. The concept of burning your boats is often traced back to a story that's associated with the conquest of the Aztec Empire by Hernan Cortez in 1519, right? And so on uh, line 66, a long while ago, a great warrior faced a situation which made it necessary for him to make a decision which ensured his success in the battlefield. He was about to send his armies against a powerful foe whose men outnumbered his own. He loaded up his soldiers into boats, sailed to the enemy country, unloaded the soldiers and the equipment, and then he gave the orders to burn the ships that just carried them. Burn them! In addressing his men before the first battle, he said, <laughs> You see those boats going up in smoke? That means we cannot leave these shores alive unless we win. We now have no choice. We win or we perish. He didn't leave him any other choice. You either, you either win or you perish. That, I guarantee, put a burning desire into every one of those soldiers, right? That's a burning desire. They burned the boats. There's no other way. You, you, you win or you die. That's, that's it. There's, there's no other option. And every person who wins in any undertaking must be willing to burn his ships and cut all sources of retreat. By default, as humans, when we have these sources of retreat, whether they're unconscious or not, we take them. Only by doing so can, we, can one be sure of maintaining that state of mind known as a burning desire to win. And that's absolutely essential to win. Now, put in the chat, have you ever done something that after you did it, you said to yourself, well, <laughs> there's no turning back now. Put a one, if you've ever actually burned a bow, like, well, yeah, there's no, no turning back. Yeah. Yep. And I remember, so it's kind of funny, but I remember, uh, I think uh, two years ago, I took my wife to uh, Universal Studios uh, in, in Orlando and I took her to the Hulk roller coaster. 
she does not like roller coasters. And I said, don't worry. It's, it'll, be, it'll be fine. Don't worry. It'll, it'll be fine. And we get up and closer and she's about ready to back out. She's like, oh, I'm going to go through. I'm not going to do this. I'm getting out of line. Finally sits down. She's about ready to get up. And there go those seatbelts. Kunk, kunk. It's like, your boats are burned, honey. There's no turning back. You're on the ride. You're, you're going for the ride. You know, that, that is burning your boats. You, you have no other option at that point. And when I started my first company in 1996, so my company, first, first company was in 1996, and I was still working for corporate. For two years, I struggled and not much movement in that company. Virtually did nothing. Very few sales, very few things. In 98, I was fired from that job. Fired from my, not that, not my company, from my corporate job. In 2000, I sold that company for $6 million. So in two, first two years, absolutely nothing. Second two years, buckle up. I was put in a position where I had to succeed or my family was going to starve, right? Corporate was my boat. That was my escape hatch and my subconscious knew it. But when we don't have uh, that, here's the thing, you don't have to have that life event in order to recognize that. And that's part of what the, the book teaches is you don't have to get fired from your job. You don't have to have these big life events. You can actually do those by yourself. You don't have to have these big events. And again, I'm not telling you to quit your job, but we all have ships that we need to burn. We all have things that we need to burn. Friends, food, jobs, whatever it is, there's things that we're using as an escape hatch to go back and play it safe. You know, what ships, write this down and, and think about this over the next couple of days. What ships do you have that you need to burn? Again, it doesn't have to be people, it doesn't have to be jobs, but what do you need to, what do you need to burn? You know, it's like, I remember when I was uh, first starting to lose weight and starting to do things. It's like, I had to get rid of food out of the, out of the, you know, pantry, right? They were in there, they were in there. And it's like, I always knew it. I, I would always go back there, right? Until I threw all that crap away and got it out of the house. I was going to go back. There was an escape hatch. Oh, I, ha I had a great day. Let's celebrate. I'm going to eat a piece of cake. Oh, I had a bad day. I'm going to eat a piece of cake and celebrate, make myself feel better, right? No, we always make the excuses, no matter what it is, to go back to that escape hatch. So lines uh, 608. So how can one harness and use the power of desire? This will be, this will be answered. It's actually answered in this chapter, as well as subsequent chapters in the book. That's really what, the, again, that's what these things build and do, uh, is build the desire. To all... These I wish to convey the thought that all achievement, no matter what may be its nature or its purpose, must begin with an intense burning desire for something definite. Not a wish, not a want. Again, it might start off as a wish, but the achievement will always start with the burning desire. Your wish is not going to get you anything. It's not until it becomes a burning desire. Through some strange, powerful principle of mental chemistry, which she has never divulged, nature wraps up in the impulse of strong desire, that something, which recognizes no such word as impossible and accepts no such reality as failure. When you build a burning desire, you find a way to keep going. And here's the thing, we've all done it. You, you have had something in your life where you've had a burning desire for it, and you know that feeling. Come hell or high water, I'm going to get that. I'm going to do that. It's going to happen. We've all been there, right? It's all, it, it, at some scale, it's all happened to some of to all of us at one time in our life. And that's the feeling that we need to get to. That's the burning desire. So the chapter on desire lays out six steps that we're going to go over. And this is uh, from the book, page 28, line 102 through 119. And these aren't suggestions. You have to embody these to magnetize your subconscious mind. You know, your subconscious mind doesn't know right from wrong, good from bad. It just knows what is. And your subconscious mind is very literal. It's extremely literal. If you say you want more money and you get a dollar bill, you find a dollar, guess what? Your subconscious mind checks out. You got more money. You've got to be very specific on what you ask for because what you ask for is what you're going to get. It's, it is extremely literal. So you may complain that it is impossible for you to see yourself in possession of money before you actually have it. Now, as I said, we have to have these thoughts that are outside our current awareness. We have to see, we have to see it before we will ever have it. So number one is 
fix in your mind the exact amount of money that you desire. And again, it's not sufficient to merely say, I want plenty of money. Be definite to the amount, down to the damn penny. You know, there, and by, by the way, there's a psychological reason for definiteness of, of, of your desire and your purpose, uh, which I might go through when we get to that step. I might put some of that uh, neuro, uh, neuroscience in there and to show you why there's an actual reason for it. And then write in the box, why? Why do you want that exact amount? Again, here we're trying to build your, your, your desire. So why do you want that amount? Why, or if you don't want to do money, what's the success that you want? What is it? Uh, complete my book. You know, write my book, whatever it is that you're desiring that you're doing, it doesn't have to be money. Put that down, put down exactly what you want and then put why. Number two, determine exactly what you intend to give in return for the money that you desire, right? Everything is a cost. Nothing's for free. You know, how about, uh, how about, uh, if you don't have anything specific, you know, how about your passion? You know, what you want to do? How about, uh, persistence, you know, giving up on giving up? How about time to the process? I'm going to give time to the process. How about your entire conscious and subconscious mind, your energy, your, your attention, you know, stop watching TV, whatever it is, what do you intend to give in order to get that, what you're desiring? Don't go outside your bounds to give, you know, don't, don't, uh, give up on like your, your values or your family or your health. The cost of what you intend to give could be higher than the value of what you're really wanting. So be sure that you say what you're going to give, that it's something that's not going to compromise uh, what you're, who you are, really. And number three, establish a definite date for when you intend to possess the money or the desire, whenever you, your book finished, whatever it is. And what does that date, you know, so when is that? Put that date. You have to have, from a mental standpoint, you have to have that date. And why is that date important? Is it a birthday? Is it a, you know, something special? Is it an anniversary? Why do you want that date? Why is that date special to you? But you have to put a date down for when you want to do that. Number four, create a definite plan for carrying out your desire and begin at once. After this challenge, start, do it. After the challenge, start. Whether you are ready for it or not, put this plan into action. Now, here's the thing. It says a definite plan. It doesn't say a detail plan. It doesn't say a plan complete with all the people, the tech, the processes, the logo, the, it doesn't say that. It says a definite plan. You know, what is one to three steps that you need to take? And here's the thing, anything beyond two steps is gonna change anyways, right? You're gonna meet new people. You're gonna learn new things. You're gonna have different ideas. You just need one or two things and then you reevaluate, right? It's a success loop. You reevaluate, you do new steps. You know, as MLK Jr. said, you don't have to see the whole staircase. Just take the first step. You don't have to see the whole thing. You're not supposed to see the whole thing. And if you try to see the whole thing, you're just never going to start. You know, think about it. If you knew the steps to get all the way there, you'd already be there. You know, examples for me for, for you know, steps for definite plan. You know, call 10 people for my mastermind group finish the course that I'm in, anything if it's moving me towards my goal. And then you reassess and you keep adding steps. You reassess, you keep adding steps. So don't get bogged down on this step that you need a detailed plan for how you're going to accomplish your goal because you'll never get there, right? What's one or two steps and it's a definite plan, not a detailed plan. And then fifth, write a, out a clear concise statement of the amount of money that you want to acquire, uh, name the time limit for it, state what you intend to give in return, and describe clearly the plan on which you intend to accumulate it. This is your statement of desire. So when you hear people calling, you know, talking about a statement of desire, that's the statement of desire. So write this out. And uh, you don't have to do it on this. You can think outside the box. There's many ways you can do a statement of desire. And here is a real life statement of desire and thinking outside the box. Everyone here probably knows Jim Carrey, right? And he has spoken about how Think and Grow Rich influenced his life and his career, and particularly in terms of his approach to visualization and goal setting. In a speech given in 2012 at the University of Southern California graduation ceremony, Carrey mentioned the book and one of the things that has helped him to manifest his dreams and to achieve success. He said, I would literally stand in front of the mirror with my checkbook, write myself a check for $10 million for acting services rendered and date it five years in advance. 
right? That's what he would do. One of uh, the stories of, again, he's telling, uh, I think this was on Oprah maybe, but one of the stories that was of him writing himself the, the $10 million check. And it's the one he actually kept in his pocket. I uh, had Thanksgiving 1995 for the date written on it for acting services rendered. This is a statement of desire, right? This is exactly what he, what he wants, the amount he wants, uh, what he's going to do for it, the date, right? Everything, it's a statement of desire. And then just before Thanksgiving 1995, he found out he was going to be making $10 million for acting for Dumb and Dumber, right? So he he's, he's used Think and Grow Rich to get where he wants to go. And he actually said that I think he's put he actually put that actual check that he carried around for years uh, in his father's casket. But that is a statement of desire. You can do yours any way you want. You know, be creative on it. And then really the sixth step is just reading your statement of desire out twice a day. You know, at least twice a day, read that statement. You're trying to magnetize your mind of what you want. You know, this is telling your mind from a positive standpoint, this is what I want to see. Don't worry about how. Don't worry. Don't get it. Don't how yourself. Uh, just stay the statement desire. Your subconscious mind in the background is going to be pulling things together, right? It's going to be pulling things. You're going to start having ideas. And again, that's part of the you know part of the steps within uh, within the book. All right, so let's move to our second deep dive. There is a seldom talked about principle behind the success of every winning athlete, every famous musician, every wealthy business person I know, and probably everybody that you know as well. And it's not their IQ. It's not a college GPA. It's not the right family name. It's not good looks. They have all surrounded themselves with other successful people. So let's dive into, to me, one of Think and Grow Rich's most crucial steps, the power of the mastermind. And what I really want to do is have you find out what a real genuine mastermind is and the influence that they have, you know, the magic that they have. And this chapter is only like seven pages long, right? This whole chapter is only seven pages long but it is absolutely crucial and it's intertwined with so many other chapters. The mastermind is, is in literally probably six or seven different chapters. And since 1995, I've been a part of a mastermind group. Uh, back then it was just friends getting together, talking about ideas, brainstorming, right? Getting around other successful people. And since 2009, I've been uh, in formal mastermind groups and I've also launched and I run my own mastermind groups. Uh, they have had, by far the most significant impact on both my personal life and my career, uh, success in my business because of them, uh, truly because of them. A mastermind group is one of the most powerful tools ever used. It really is. It is such a powerful thing to do. And the concept of surrounding ourselves with, you know, these successful, big thinking people is as old as history, right? You look at ancient Greece and Aristotle and, and Socrates, they all surrounded themselves with those who would challenge their own thinking, uh, and expand their arsenal of possibilities. Benjamin Franklin uh, belonged to such a group, which he called, I think he called it Huntu, was his mastermind group was called Huntu. Andrew Carnegie had a mastermind group, so did Henry Ford. You know, in fact, Ford's mastermind group, uh, he'd meet with all, you know, Thomas Edison and Harvey Firestone and all these others in their winter mansions in Coral, uh, Coral Gables, Florida. But it was Napoleon Hill who explained it clearly and encouraged people to gather together in a structured, repeatable environment for the success of all in that group. It's not the success of one, it's the success of all. In a true mastermind group, as explained in Think and Grow Rich, you get a combination of brainstorming, of uh, mentoring, of peer accountability. You get to tap into infinite intelligence and encouragement from the group, uh, which really is setting to help both develop yourself and them as well. And a mastermind group assists each member in achieving their goals. It's not just about you, it's about everybody in the group. No one's important, everybody's important. Members push each other to make strong aims, and more importantly, we push each other to achieve them. That's the goal of the mastermind group. And Warren Buffett uh, tweeted this the, uh, maybe a couple months ago. And I absolutely love this tweet. He said, surround yourself with people that push you to do and be better. No drama or negativity, just higher goals and higher motivation, good times and positive energy, no jealousy or hate, simply bringing out the absolute best in each other. 
This is exactly what a mastermind group or alliance is. And let me ask you a question. Do you think, put a, put a one, in the, put a one in, the, in the chat, do you think Warren uh, just puts this out there so he can keep his social media fresh? Or put a one if you think he really does this. Do you think he really does this? Yeah, you're, you're damn right he does this. And that's the thing, a lot of successful people give us these clues all the time. They're, they, they publish these things all the time. We just sometimes don't pay attention. or like, yeah, that'll never, he doesn't do that, come on. He doesn't have time for that crap. No, he does that. Successful people of all levels surround themselves with other successful people, formal or informal, whether they call it a mastermind or not, whether they think it's like that, whether they think they're masterminding or not, that's what's actually happening. So line 14, again, this is in the power of the mastermind. Power is essential for success in the accumulation of money or any success. Plans are inert and useless without sufficient power to translate them into action. This chapter will describe the, uh, the method by which an individual may attain and apply the power. Power may be defined as organized and intelligently directed knowledge. Power, as the terms here used, refer to organized effort. Sufficient enough to enable the individual to mute the desire into the monetary or the physical equivalent. Organized effort is produced through the coordination of effort of two or more people whose work towards a definite end in a spirit of harmony. I like that organized effort, right? That's the mastermind. Gaining power through the mastermind. So the mastermind may be defined as coordination of knowledge of effort in a spirit of harmony between two or more people for the attainment of a definite purpose. Now, one of the things that we're gonna to get to is one, what a, what a true mastermind is, because I truly want you to, to really take that. Two is how to start your own mastermind. I, I, you, know, you start your mastermind, how to join a mastermind, however you want to go, but I want you to see the power of those and I want you to really look and see what, what the true mastermind is. Because in the last couple of years, you're seeing a lot of people use the term mastermind. People are using mastermind this, I'm doing a mastermind here, I'm doing a mastermind this, and they're not really masterminds at all. You know, Here's a few things that I, I see all the time that they say it's a mastermind and it's not. They are not courses. Masterminds are not workshops. You know, they're not classes. This right here is not a mastermind. You know, they're not these short-term wins. They're not these short-term things. A mastermind is a small group of people, normally eight to 12, and we'll go through that. Uh, it takes normally three to six months just to gel with your small group. It is the repeatable group. Uh, it's an investment with compounding returns. You know, it's a long game. And one of the, as a matter of fact, one of the mastermind groups that I'm in, there's seven of us. Uh, we don't allow more than 10 in that group, but there's seven of us that have been together over five years. So that's how long these masterminds go. It is not a course. It is not, if someone tries to get you in a mastermind and there's 50, 200 people in there, it's not a mastermind, right? It's a group coaching uh, at best. So those are not, absolutely not mastermind groups. And for me, this is really where the power is right here. And it's the psychic phase, what he calls the psychic phase of the mastermind uh, principle. He says it's much more abstract, much more difficult to comprehend because it has reference to the spiritual forces with which the human race as a whole is not well acquainted. You may catch a significant suggestion from this statement. No two minds ever come together without thereby creating a third invisible and tangible force, which may be likened to a third mind. I want to read that again. No two minds ever come together without thereby creating a third invisible, uh, intangible force, which may be likened to a third mind, AKA the mind, AKA infinite intelligence, whatever you want to call it. That's what a mastermind gets you connected to. And when two or more people coordinate in a spirit of harmony and work towards a definite objective, they place themselves in a position through that alliance to absorb power directly from the greater universal storehouse of infinite intelligence. This is the greatest of all sources of power, and it is a source which the genii turns. It is the source which every great leader turns, whether they may be conscious or not. It happens all the time in mastermind groups. It really does. That's, that's really part of what the mastermind does. 
like last year in one of my mastermind groups that, that I'm a part of, one of the guys just finished his new book. He works with his wife and they, uh, uh, you know, they teach people how to work with their spouse in business and have a, you know, a, a balanced life between business and home. And they work together, they run their company together and they kind of teach that. And he came up in the mastermind when on his hot seat, he's like, I don't know what to name the book. Can you help name the book? And we all came up, uh, we did a mastermind on it and we came up with a book, uh, the book name and it's called Tandem. You can actually go look up the book. It's called Tandem. Uh, and it's a perfect, you know, the, the logo for the book is a tandem bicycle. It's like, you have to ride together. You have to do things together in order to stay up. It was, so, and that's the name of the book. And none of the people in that mastermind would have ever come up with that name by ourselves. If he would have went individually and said, hey, what do you think about a book name? None of us would have been able to come up with that. It's the collective genius that came together and we started to mastermind. We started to do things and bounce things off and you you dip into infinite intelligence. And we came up with, you know, with the name of his book. And that's just one example, but that's what the, the power of them do. You, you tap into these things. And in order for Think and Grow Rich to, and really law of success to make any sense, you're going to have to buy into this concept. And this has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do, but you're going to have to buy into this concept that we are spiritual beings gifted with intellect, living in a physical world. And that's where that SIP on the side is from. We've got the spiritual side. You have all of these ideas, all of these things that are floating through the ether. We bring those into us, into our intellect, into our ideas, right? A hunch, whatever you want to call it. We Boom, we get this idea. And that drives our results. So we are a spiritual being gifted with the intellect in a physical world. And Hill, Carnegie, Ford, Edison, all knew as millions of others have discovered since that a mastermind group can uh, focus special energy on your efforts, on your desire in the form of knowledge, resources, and spiritual energy. You have a mastermind as one of the ways to get access to the mind, to the universal mind. You know, those ideas are up there. They're, they're floating around. You think, uh, you know, the Wright brothers just came up with the idea to fly? No, it's been there forever. That's been floating in the ether for thousands of years. They just happened to become aware, right? They became aware of that idea. They didn't, do, they didn't invent anything. They became aware of something, right? Those are all flying. Those are all out there on those, on that level of the ether of all these different vibrations, these ideas that are all out there floating. That's like, I, I kind of laugh when someone does something and then someone else says, they stole my idea. I had that idea. They stole it. No, they became aware of it just like you did. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't steal your idea, right? So uh, line 77, keep in mind the fact that there are only two known elements in the whole universe, energy and matter. And it's well-known fact that matter may be broken down into units of molecules, atoms, and electrons. And there are units of matter which may be isolated, separated, and analyzed. And likewise, there are units of energy. And the human mind is a form of energy. We have vibration. It's energy. That's all it is, right? It's energy as a part of, and, and part of that energy is of the spiritual nature. And when the minds of two uh, people coordinated in a spirit of harmony, the spiritual units of energy of each mind form, a, form an infinity and constitute the psychic phase of the mastermind group. They really are that powerful. And again, they, they take time. They're not something that's... You, you can't expect to go into a mastermind and, and get a whole bunch of success in a, in a month, right? That's just not how they work. Going to lines 112, a group of brains coordinated or connected in a spirit of harmony will provide more thought energy than a single brain, just as a group of electric batteries will provide more power than a single battery. But I've always been interested in the notion of what I call compounding energy. Right, that's when uh, you know the phenomenon when the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. It's like when one plus one equals four. That's an awesome thing to do, right? One plus one equals four, and those right there are draft horses. Have you ever heard of a draft horse? Each of those can normally pull about eight thousand pounds. So if you take a draft horse, it can pull about eight thousand pounds, but two can easily pull twenty four thousand pounds when working together, and with a little bit of training they can pull nearly 32,000 pounds together. That's four times what we could mathematically expect them to do, right? Eight plus eight, that's 16,000, right? But they can pull almost 32,000. But that's the incredible power of the mastermind principle. It's that unique combination of power that comes from working together 
and from the spiritual form of the universe that is added to the process. And again, this is, this is tied into so many chapters within the book. And he goes on on 142. This is a very telling and important statement. Man take on the nature and the habits and the power of thought of those whom they associate in a spirit of sympathy and harmony. We take on the spirit. And I want you to, so I'm going to get into a little bit of neuroscience here, just because I'm always the type of person that says, if you say this works, well, I, I kind of want to know why. So let's get into just a tiny bit of neuroscience. We won't get too deep into it, but this really ties into the mastermind and why it works from a science level, from a physical level of our body. So let's look at, again, some neuroscience behind this, some technologies that we have built in that support what Hill say and Jim Rohn, you know, Jim Rohn had the quote, you know, we become the average of the people that we hang around with the most, you know, uh, Tony Robbins, the proximity and power. There's so many ways to say that. And I want to introduce you to one of your technologies called your mirror neurons. I'm not sure if you've ever heard of your mirror neurons, uh, but it's a really, really cool feature. Now, mirror neurons are a type of neuron that fire when you observe someone carrying out an action. So when you, uh, for example, when you see me here teaching, your mirror neurons in your brain start firing up, allowing you to understand what I am doing. And your nervous system, your nervous system sees you doing and experiencing the same thing. So right now, in your nervous system, it's experiencing as if you were standing here doing this. You're experiencing it. That's your mirror neurons. You can go look them up. It's, it's a fascinating thing that we have. And it's all in real time, all in the background, and you don't even know what's going on. You know, this provides us a direct internal experience of another person's actions and emotions, aka their energies, right? We get an, a direct experience of it. For me, this is, again, this is the human technology behind the sayings that you become the average of the five people you hang out with because you see and experience what the people around you are doing. You are ex experiencing it in your own nervous system. If I, li if I literally cut open an, an, uh, a lemon right now and I took a bite of a lemon, your mouth would start watering. You didn't take a bite of the lemon, right? If I actually took you through that ex exercise of, of me biting into a lemon, your mouth would start watering. That's your mirror neurons kicking in saying, hey, I, I'm experiencing the same exact thing. But that's why masterminds work. They work on a literally a neuroscience level for us. They, they're, there's, this isn't woo-woo crap anymore, right? There's science behind all this stuff. So today is about starting or joining a mastermind group. And assembling a mastermind group is easy. You know, you probably already have an alliance that you can use uh, to start an initial mastermind. Choose people who are already where you'd like to be in life or who are at least, you know, one step above you or right there with you. You know, for instance, I mean, I hate, to, I don't want this to sound bad, but if your goal is to become a millionaire, you're not going to get much thought energy if everyone in your mastermind group is making 10,000 a year, right? It's just not going to, it's like if I went into a mastermind group with Elon Musk, I'm not going to offer as much thought energy as they do, right? I'm just not, I'm not there, but it's, so people who are, are kind of where you want to be. And of course, uh, approaching uh, successful people can be scary, but remember they get just as much universal power as you do uh, from the mastermind group. So don't be afraid to ask people to be in your group or to ask someone to be in their group. Everyone, again, the mastermind group, everybody wins. Uh, the other people in your group uh, are going to invite people who you would like to be around, right? People who you, you know, like, and, and possibly even trust already. Uh, I don't recommend any family members. I don't recommend like good friends because you're not going to have that same connection. Uh, start by making a list of five to 10 people that you would choose and maybe not someone that you know, but five to 10 people that you would like, even if you know them or not, right? That you would like to be in your mastermind group. And write them down uh, and start, uh, start writing them down to call them if you want to create your own mastermind group. And running your own mastermind group, you know, start the meetings, uh, so here, I'm going to tell you exactly how I run my groups. So my mastermind groups that I run, they are no more than six to 12 people. Six pe anything under six people, and you don't quite get the enough energy of the people in the group. And any more than 12 people, it's just too many people. Uh, you don't have enough to, uh, people don't get enough time in what we call the hot seat. So uh, do uh, no more than six to 12 people. 
I meet uh, on my mastermind groups, it's always biweekly. So I m meet on a biweekly for 90 minutes. Uh, we all play full out. We always start the meeting with a positive win, like every, every time everyone gets two minutes and what's their win since in the last two weeks. A mastermind group is someplace that you can, there's no such thing as bragging in a mastermind group, right? No such thing as bragging. You're talking about your positives or your wins. And then every mastermind group, we have what's called three hot seats and we rotate those out. So every, every time we have the group, the three people and then the three people and it rotates through. So everyone gets a hot seat every six to eight weeks. And that's one reason why you don't want more than 12 people because if you do three per, per group, they're so long between the hot seats. Uh, so again, no more than 12 people. And that's, so this is actually my formula that I use for, uh, for my, for my mastermind groups. And it's, and it's a very powerful formula. I've been doing these for, for, you know, several years, quite a few years. And that's kind of the magic formula for the number of people that I've found. And, you know, the, the hot seats. And again, think about what uh, Warren Buffett said, no drama, negativity, just higher goals, higher motivation. Good times, positive energy, no jealousy or hate, simply bringing out the very best in everybody. That is what it is all about. And then if you're just starting out in mastermind groups, I do, like if you've never been in a mastermind group, I do recommend that you try to get into one just to get to know it. Uh, you try to get a feel for it. It's like going in and, and test driving it, right? So I, I recommend you go and you, you join a mastermind group most mastermind groups are a minimum of three to six months uh, commitments if you join a mastermind group. Uh, that's because it takes time to gel. Uh, but what's funny is when people get in a mastermind group, a lot of times they don't change. It's like they will be in for two, the average is probably two to three years in a group before they move to maybe a different group at a different level or they move around. So normally uh, it's normally like two years that you're in with one. So you want to make sure that you, uh, you choose wisely on the mastermind group. But that's really what the mastermind is. It, again, it is such a powerful force for success. No, no successful person has ever done it without a mastermind group. I've never seen it, never, never have. So that's the power of the mastermind group. Start one, uh, find one, get in one, whatever it is, there is power in that. That I could give up so many things. There's one thing I will never give up is a mastermind group. I mean, that's how much they mean to me is I, I will never give one up.